Welcome to the Micro Brewer Podcast. Here's your host, Joe Shellaru. Welcome to Microbrewer Podcast number nine. So we are one below double digits, you know, so I just get pumped up for every podcast and this one's no exception. So uh, if you're new to the podcast, I really want to thank you. And uh, this podcast is keeps growing and I just really appreciate it. It's so awesome the amount of listens that we've been getting and the amount of support. So again, thank you so much. Um, if you're new to the podcast, I, I encourage you to go back and check out some of the older podcast editions that we have too. Uh, you can just find those in iTunes and Stitcher. And then if you subscribe to the podcast, then you can just get those automatic downloads as they come along. Uh, for other people who have been listening to the podcast for a little while, uh, if you get a chance and you're getting value out of this podcast, uh, I really encourage you to go to iTunes and just leave a quick review. Uh, this really helps to get the word out for our podcast. And the more reviews that we have, it just gets us in the search results and then just gets the word out to more people who are looking at starting up a brewery or just want to take their brewery to the next level. So um, if you've never given a review in iTunes before and don't really know how to do it, you can just go to microbrewer.com slash iTunes. And that's microbrewer spelled M-I-C-R-O-B-R-E-W-R. Uh, so for this podcast, we have Tyson Starling from Atlantic Brewing Company, and I, I really had a fun time talking with Tyson. Uh, so originally, he was a credit analyst and uh, ended up working in distribution and then going to uh, Atlantic Brewing Company. So he'll walk you through his story. But uh, he provided a lot of great insights in working with distributors and how to increase sales and just some uh, unique ways and really cheap ways that you can get distributors to help increase your beer sales. Um, he also talks about uh, just uh, how powerful labeling and branding can be and then goes into a lot of detail about uh, weighing the pros and cons of going between bottling versus ca- or bottling versus uh, canning your beer. And so th- there's been a lot more cans that have been coming out of the craft beer scene. And as you can see, Tyson, is, he really likes canning. So he'll walk us through the process of that. So at this point, we'll just jump into the interview. All right. And today on the podcast, I want to welcome Tyson Starling from Atlantic Brewing Company. And welcome, Tyson. Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to have you. So I was wondering for people who aren't familiar with you, um, if you could just go through kind of your background and how you get into brewing. Sure. Um, I actually I went to university uh, and the university I went to didn't offer a master's. But so I uh, took a minor in business because uh, for whatever reason, I really thought it'd be cool to wear a suit every day. And uh, so I got out of university, graduated, and got a job as a credit analyst for a bank. And uh, the suit thing wore off, like, in a week. <laughs> I was so done tying ties. <laughs> um, but uh, what really honestly happened was, uh, as a credit analyst, you're looking at commercial files all the time and underwriting them and um, meeting with business owners. And uh, one time I went to a meeting, and we we're going to foreclose on this guy. And like, this is the worst meeting I've ever been in my life. I like, I'm sitting across from this guy. We're going to take all his stuff, his house. And the guy, like, you know, he's so upset. He's ready to like punch me and I wouldn't have blamed him. But I, I remember coming home from that and I'm like, why do I do this? Like, this is the worst job. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, so I, uh, in looking through some of the credit files, I realized a customer of mine was hiring a sales rep. And so I was like, okay, that's it. So I picked up the phone. I'm like, I know you're looking for a sales rep. I have no sales experience. Do you want to take me on? <laughs> and uh, so I got into, I was in window and door sales. And uh, I, I did that for two years. And uh, really the whole time, I've always been a craft beer guy. There was a shop that was near my office that I used to go to all the time. And uh, I was in there one day and the territory manager for a distributor was uh, talking with the store owner and he's like, do you know anybody who like, you know, some sales experience that could, that could take this job. And so I was like, immediately I was like, Hey, I, I'm a sales guy. How about, uh, we meet. And, uh, so I, I landed that job and that's what got me started in the craft beer business. And the distributor I worked for, we had really cool brands like Dogfish Head, Stone, Rogue, Flying Dog. Um, and, uh, we also had Atlantic Brewing, which is a local beer to my area. And, uh, Actually, I live literally one mile from the brewery, 
And uh, so I worked for that for three years as their sales rep. And the owner of the brewery really liked me. He, you know, he realized that hardworking guy. I really liked craft beer. And uh, he's a little bit older and had wanted to get someone uh, that's younger to do some of the day-to-day operations so that he can sort of start phasing himself out. And uh, so he approached me with like, you know, would you be interested in this? And I, I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And uh, so that was, uh, I think, three years ago now. And so I help him with uh, a lot of logistics, but uh, we're, we're realizing that there's a, a hole in our marketing. So I'm going to start trying to take that over. But that's sort of what, you know, small business is all about. Uh, so I've uh, I've got a lot to do. Like I, I deal with distributors on a daily basis. I set production schedules. And now I'm going to be doing some Facebook and Twitter and things like that. That's great, man. So yeah. it, one of the things that you're involved with is the daily operation of a brewery. And I know talking to a lot of people outside of the industry, whenever they hear that you're part of a brewery, they're like, oh, man, that must just be the dream job. You're sitting there drinking beer all day. That sounds so <laughs> awesome. Uh, could you give a good overview of what a normal day is actually like in a brewery? Sure. Um, and yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Everybody thinks it's the coolest job. And one of my responses is always like, you know, I worked in a bank, and they're not that dissimilar. <laughs> uh, it's one of the, high, the highest regulated industries, so you're dealing with um, a lot of filing, a lot of uh, recording of, you know, barrels produced and things like that. And so on a daily basis, you're, you're either dealing with government agencies or, or recording information to have for them. So uh, for me, my day starts uh, normally by answering uh between, say, five and ten emails f- from distributors uh, with either questions about beer or when they can get a certain product. And then I have to review our, our schedule of what we have upcoming, what we have in inventory, and then sort of figure out how I can ship what to who when. <laughs> um, and so most of my time is spent in Excel, in a calendar, and in email, uh, and very little time drinking beer. <laughs> and that's one of the things. So we just had Colin McDonald on the, the podcast and he also talked about the same thing about how data collection and making sure you've got everything in order is just such a big part of brewery and that people from the outside really don't think about. Yeah, there, there's two approaches. So I, I have other friends who are in the industry and once a month they have like a hair pulling out week where they're just trying to scramble and figure out what they've brewed, what they've shipped and how much, you know, liquid or alcohol they've made. And uh, so that's one approach. But uh, we we go with the organized one where we uh, record as we go. And uh, so that makes it quite a bit easier. Um, In Maine, you have to file on the 1st and 15th of every month for taxes. So uh, we're we're doing that twice a month. So it just makes sense to have that information recorded as you go. Yeah, yeah, that definitely does. (laughs) I can't imagine that pulling your hair out every month is is too fun. Yeah, it's usually smaller breweries, but it is quite funny to, you know, they're like, oh, geez, you know, like anywhere, like if you want to contact a a small brewer, do it after the 15th of the month would be my recommendation. (laughs) (laughs) That's good advice. (laughs) So one of the things I was hoping we could talk about, since you worked uh, for a distributor before, Um, I I know the world of distribution can be kind of confusing to someone from the outside. Uh, Could you talk about um, overall, so you're working now at the brewery, how to best uh, work with the distributors to increase sales? I know that's one of the questions that we got from some people uh, that have contacted me before. Yeah, it's really tough, actually, because uh, the way the distribution laws are set up, it's called uh, franchise law. And uh, the problem is there's there's I think there's about a thousand distributors and twenty seven hundred breweries. And so as a brewer, you don't have a lot of choice. And the other thing um, I always will liken it to like a Catholic wedding. Once you're married to a distributor, that's it. You're not getting back out of this relationship unless the distributor wants to drop you. Um, And so the one of the problems is. Once you're signed on with a distributor, you're their asset, so they can buy, sell, trade um, your brand, and you have very little say. I mean, in some states, I think you can appeal that, but it, even if you do, you're not really likely to get back out of that deal. And uh, so increasing sales with a distributor, you really have to be there for them and and support them with whatever questions they have. And then you sort of – we've noticed that – uh, with some distributors, you really just can't, like, 
moving the ball up the field is just not possible. You know, like you're sort of getting to your status quo and then you, you sort of maintain those sales. And it's not really the distributor's fault. It's that their books, their portfolios are so large. And uh, in a lot of cases, most distributors have a house, they call it like a house brand. And so you're either a Bud Miller Coors house. And those companies, I mean, they're paying for our, us, our beer to ride free on the truck. And so they have sales incentives that they have to hit. You know, like it's not like you're when we call them and say, like, hey, could you sell a pallet of this? We have an extra one. You know, Miller Coors is saying, you know, you've got to get 3000 case equivalents sold by the end of this month. You know, and so the, the, the sales guys are really tasked with doing that. But that's even though that might not be what you want as a craft brewer, you've got to realize that that's who's paying for your beer to ride on that truck. Because, you know, whatever, how, even probably, I, I would guess, I, you know, somebody like Sam Adams size, they're big enough that they could have their own fleet of trucks, but most breweries can't afford, you know, a $100,000 tractor and a driver. And uh, so, you know, the, the, it's just part of the deal. You're, you're part of the distributor's chain. So you just want to be front, front of mind for their sales rep. And it, the easiest way that we found to do that is not with uh, huge sales trips. You know, like Guinness will give you a trip to Ireland or, um, you know, like the, there's big sales incentives, like you can get a trip to Mexico for Corona, say. But what we do is we have like a little barbecue pub restaurant and we'll give, you know, guys that are in the area, you know, gift cards to come out there with their friends and family and, and not not a sales incentive driven thing. Like not you have to sell the X amount of cases. We just have them buy, you know, come on by with your family. And then they we've noticed their sales pick up. Okay. No, that that's great. And I mean, for a smaller brewery, you're not going to have a lot of money to give any of those incentives. And so one thing I've heard talking to, to multiple people about distribution, one common theme that seems to be coming out is that establishing those relationships with the distributors goes a really long way. And it doesn't yeah. have to cost a lot of money. Um, it, like your example, you know, just having them come and stop by with their families. I, I think that's a great way to build that relationship. And then there's a face behind the beer. And when they have that choice between trying to sell your beer versus somebody else's and they know you, um, right. they're probably going to push yours a little more. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, the other thing is we, we take them on like a personalized tour, you know, we'll walk them around the brew house. And then, you know, at the end of that, we always end up going to the tasting room and, and giving them... Uh, all of our beers, most even even distributors that carry our beer, most of them haven't tried all our brews because they, you know they're, they they don't get through their their portfolio. You know they've got so many beers. So once you can hand sell, uh, you know, just talk them through the beer and tell them what you were thinking when you brewed it, like why why the recipe is this way. It really does go a long long way to getting the salesman on your side. And it's not they're against you; they're just they're not with you yet. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great point too. Cause it, when, when you're having them come by, you're also educating them about the beer. So when yeah. they're trying to sell it, now they have more information on it. So yeah, uh, I, I think that's great. Hey, talking about distribution too, um, for a smaller brewer that's looking to expand their overall sales territory, do, do you have any, um, different strategies for them to do that? Well, uh, so we've at Atlantic Brewing through the years, uh, the owner, Doug, has has paired up with different distributors uh, and sort of, I guess, sort of, I guess, just life experimenting to see what works best. And so we are tied with some Bud houses, some Miller Coors houses and some really small, like independent distributors that only do craft beer. And truthfully, I think the being tied to a bigger house actually adds some structure to the distributorship, which seems to help. Um, it's not necessarily that, uh, like, that. You, even though that you're part of a big craft beer um, portfolio, you're, you're, you're not getting, or a, a big portfolio, sorry, like a Miller Coors, you don't, you are still craft beer, so you are different. And the organization that comes with such a big organ, uh, uh, distributorship like that is actually very helpful because the people that are the small distributors are just guys like me and you that are like, you know, I really like craft beer. Let's go out and sell it. But they don't necessarily have the infrastructure in place. So they're bringing in product. They, you know, they, they order when they're out of something. And then, you know, they're not looking, they don't have all the equipment and the tools that the big distributors have. So we've actually found tying with bigger houses is sometimes better, which is counterintuitive to what you would think. But the, uh, the sales approach for a smaller distributor is much better. 
you know, they're much more involved. So it's really, it, for the, for your beer, if you were to sell it, I guess you sort of have to decide, do you want wide distribution that's organized and grow, and grow sales like huge numbers? Or do you want a better hand sale, uh, with a more educated seller, perhaps? If that makes sense. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, that went across. Okay. (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So one question that I've had come up quite a bit is, um, what's the average time so uh, you give your beer to the distributor and then it finally makes its way out to a liquor store or other spots where people can actually buy it any idea what the average time is that it's sitting between leaving <laughs> your brewery and actually being drank by somebody i'm i'm scared to admit like we've we've got some bottles back like or like customer emails and like i'll ask them for the date code which uh, at one point used to just be like a uh, our guile number that we would put on our brew, but now we've actually just got it set up to do a date. And like some of it is scary. Like a year later, people are like, geez, this beer is tastes off and foamy. And I'm like, so what was the the batch number? And I, we go look it up and I'm like, you know, we're, we're 3000 batches past that. <laughs> so uh, it really depends. And we've noticed with us, the further out of our sort of concentric circle, the worse it goes for us. And I think that's actually um, not a fault of the distributor, but it's that our brand is very, very centralized to New England. And so the further out we get, the less name recognition. And so our product just does not move as well. And uh, like we're not, we're a, a pretty small brewery in the scale of things. We're at like seven to 10,000 barrels a year. And uh, we are in a huge tourist destination. Uh, Bar Harbor has a national park called Acadia National Park. And that's like people that come here are from the coast. They all, you know, like that Massachusetts, New York, uh, Connecticut. We get a lot of the, that traffic. And so we've noticed when we go further, like we're as far south as Virginia, the only skew that sells for us is our blueberry ale. Um, and that's just for the novelty of it, I think, more so than the brand recognition. And so as our brand recognition goes down, our shelf life, it's, it's much longer. Like, the, or not the shelf life's longer. They, they're staying on the shelf longer. Okay. Okay. And you talked about building the brand. How, how have you done that within your concentric area? Well, um, we have historically just sort of existed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Atlantic Brewing started in the 90s. 1991 and it was like at the dawn of craft beer so so then i mean I, in talking with the owner he's like you know it didn't even matter if it was good it was just different um and so you know their, their fermentation tanks used to be not temperature controlled and they used to be outside but people didn't know what craft beer was so if the beer got warm and it tasted funny they didn't even know you know like it was just that's what it was <laughs> it's um, just different yeah yeah they're like this isn't budweiser how neat <laughs> and uh <laughs> but but uh so from that, we've sort of just grown organically. Like we haven't really, we don't spend any money necessarily on marketing. Uh, we we do do ads and promos, uh, you know, beer events, but we don't really advertise. Like we're not in beer advocate. Uh, we're not in all about beer. Um, but as we're getting larger and now we're getting to a, a point, I think uh, that that is our new goal. Like we're, we've rebranded our brand in the last two years. We've redesigned our six packs because as we uh, produced a beer, we were just designing a label in a six pack and none of it was cohesive. So Atlantic, you could have two beers on the shelf, two six packs, and you couldn't even tell they were from the same brewery. Mm. So we've been looking at that and changing that and getting a company specific look and we're still perfecting that, but what you know, starting sort of now, we're really trying to get a brand established and get people to know us. So uh, we haven't done any (laughs) advertising in in order, I guess, to answer your question. Okay. Yeah. And and that's one of the things uh, we recently had a, I had an article that we put together and I just kind of branding and transforming your beer. uh, And that was with uh, Harvey Shepard, who was a great resource to talk to. And he was talking about the consistency in your labeling and just so people can look and each of your labels might be different, but they overall know that it ties to the same brewery if the beers are sitting right next to each other. So I, I think what you're talking about is great. Yeah, yeah, we've we've definitely noticed uh we actually regionally we we have a beer called Bar Harbor Real Ale and uh before we started the rebranding people called us Bar Harbor Brewing 
which is another brewery. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, we own that brand as well, but but we um, they didn't start together. Like that's something that the owner of Atlantic bought them out when they wanted to retire. But people didn't realize that we were Atlantic Brewing. We were the real ale company, and so this rebranding, people now understand that we're one brand, which has been it's it, it's astounding how much of a difference that has made in sales because they instead of just picking up a real ale. Now they'll pick up our real ale and our summer ale. You know, people on vacation will now pick up all of the brands because they'll try one and they'll say, this is a good beer. So then they'll try all four of our six packs or five of them versus just picking up the one they recognize. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And yeah. I, I mean, especially with the, it, when your beer is sitting on the shelf with a thousand different ones, just having that commonality between them is, is huge. Because if, yeah, like you're exactly what you're saying, if somebody has one of your beers and it's great, they're going to try the other ones too. And I've done the same thing where if I have somebody's beer and it's bad, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm probably not going to try yeah. the other ones. <laughs> yep. That's a, that's a fair point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as long as your beer, your beer is good. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. If your beer is bad, don't, don't co-brand them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Key takeaway. <laughs> so overall for Atlantic Brewing, uh, how much of your sales are, do you, first off, do you can or bottle? We bottle. Okay. Uh, bottle. We do bottles, kegs, and uh, so we have half barrels, six barrels, which are the two standard sizes. And we, in one of our beers, we have a quarter barrel. Uh, and then the we do 22 ounce for our specialty beers, and then we have 12 ounce glass for our uh, regular six packs. Okay. How, how much of the sales are kegs versus uh, all the bottles that you just talked about? Um, our packaging is almost 50-50, um, and I, I don't think that's normal, but I think that um, our – so our if you were to look at a, the year-round sales, I, our, our package is much higher. So our, our bottles, our glass, it's higher, but the, because of Bar Harbor being such a tourist destination in the summer months – our uh, our draft sales go through the roof because every restaurant, uh, you know, we're, we're we're very well situated in our local community, and so almost every restaurant that you walk into has one of our at least one of our beers on draft, and so that sort of equals out our sales. Whereas, I think had did we not live in such a tourist destination, I think it would be much more towards package and less to uh, draft. Okay. Yep. So for draft, how, is it just in the main area that you're going, or is it outside of that? Well, uh, when I started with Atlantic, uh, we had just been distributing draft in state, um, and so this was because uh, owning your own cooperage is extremely expensive, and uh, so you will find that when you ship 16 kegs to New York, uh, they don't come back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so our the owner of the brewery had done this in the past, and then decided, you know, he he said, I'm you know I'm not sh- I'm done one way shipping kegs. Um, and when I came on board, I had introduced them to MicroStar. So now we distribute out of state in draft. Um, and the way MicroStar works, if you're not familiar, is uh, you forecast your sales for the year, and you tell MicroStar you would like so many kegs. So say it's a hundred a month. Uh, and you can pick the dates, and so you can look at your racking schedule and say, you know, I need them on the on the seventh and the tenth, uh, or seventh and fifteenth, or something like that. And they'll have the kegs there for you. You have to wash them just like you would with your own return kegs, and then you have them to package. So you want them about a week before you really need them, you know, depending on how your brewery is set up. But you, unless you're washing them, filling at the same time, I don't know. Just depends. We, we wash all ours on a particular day and then have them ready. Um, but uh, th- this is now a one-way sale. So when New York picks up, because it's a MicroStar keg and it's in their network, they pick up and we transfer ownership through MicroStar's system to that brewery, uh, to that distributor, I'm sorry. And uh, they get it in their warehouse, they ship it out to their customers, and they bring it back. But but MicroStar picks that back up. You know, it goes back into the MicroStar network. So it may be in Maine to get filled. It goes to New York. It gets uh, cleaned, goes, drops off at, say, Six Point Brewery. They clean it, you know, and ship it, and maybe it ends up in Colorado. So you're not getting the same kegs back. You're just getting a keg. Um, And so it makes it much easier for out-of-state distribution. 
Oh, okay. So j- just to make sure that I understand. So MicroStar, they are they own the kegs themselves. And so when you're shipping out, you don't have to get your keg back because they actually owned it. And I'm guessing you're just paying, you're, you're essentially renting it or you're paying a certain proportion of every keg that you get? Yes, exactly. Um, so the, yeah, MicroStar owns the cooperage. They also, they pay you a rental fee and it's not, it's, uh, it's not bad. You know, it's, it's, if you look at depreciating your kegs because they actually do get beat up out in the field, it's really not, uh, it's not, co- it's not expensive. You, you really are almost paying the same as if you own your own keg. It's, it's probably, you know, a dollar or so more a keg which if you're doing huge volume, I guess would add up very quickly. But the advantage of being able to sell out of state and not have to get your cooperage back is, is well worth it in my okay. opinion. Yeah, that's great. And then when you're selling out of state, so are you still going through distributors, but using MicroStars keg? Is that how that works? Yeah. So like on a, if you look at any keg, you'll always see the keg ring on the, on the top. Um, and so we, you know, it's identified to our distributor by the keg ring, so they know what it is. But all the kegs, uh, you may have seen these in bars and things or just on trucks, but they have a blue M on the side and then a star. <laughs> okay. And uh, most breweries use them, actually. MicroStar, I think, is the, at least in this, in, in my market, it seems like that is the dominant um, keg rental service. Okay, that's great. And and what we'll do is um, for the podcast, we'll have show notes put together too. So you can go to microbrewer.com and then click on the show notes and then we'll have links to MicroStar too because I, I think this is a great resource that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, Most people in the industry will be familiar probably. Uh, and there's another one called Keg Credit, which is similar, but that's you're renting and owning your own cooperage. So you're still, you're back in the same boat as having to get back your kegs, which um, from our experience has been very difficult to do because distributors aren't going to ship back. If they order 16 kegs, they're going to wait till they get all 16 back. So they're not going to ship 12 kegs. And if you're a brewery owner, a small brewery owner, and you have a hundred thousand dollars tied up in kegs, you need those kegs back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't fill kegs that aren't there. So, uh, waiting for those kegs is very cost, uh, costly, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hey, one other question that I've had. Um, so, so you guys are bottling. Um, I, I just got a question from Lauren. He's thinking about starting up a brewery in Alaska. And overall, he's going back and forth between whether tr- he wants to bottle or can. Uh, do you have any perspectives on that? I do. Um, we uh, actually just purchased a new bottling line for our facility. Um, and not we did look at cans. And actually... Um, both the owner and the I agreed that can is is a lot has a lot of advantages over bottle. Honestly, we feel that we're too far along to switch. You know, people recognize us as our bottle. They they know our six pack. We think the risk is too high to switch to a can because pe- we may lose our clientele who are familiar with us, but don't you know they they just know Atlantic as the six pack uh, uh, of beer and bottles. But canning itself is actually, in my opinion, a better way to go because uh, you actually get less air um, because it, in the neck of every beer bottle, you have, uh, say, an inch space or two inch space that should be filled with CO2, but it, there's possible to be air in there. And even with CO2 in there, the beer deteriorates faster. Um, and the... Uh, other advantage of a can is that it's it blocks sunlight, which is a huge problem for beer. If you've ever had a Heineken or a Corona, you can taste the skunkiness uh, of the hop, and that's because the sunlight is hitting the beer, uh, or just light in general. Um, and so light and beer don't get along well. And so that's why all, most beer bottles are brown, is to try and stop that. But cans are perfect. You know, they're impermeable sunlight, so it's just a much better... Uh, uh, much better seal or, or blockage from the sunlight. And then the the crowns fail on bottles. Uh, and so at our brewery, we have we don't do twist off because the the seal on the twist off is, is less than a full cap. So for us, you need a bottle opener, which is another barrier to entry when you're out somewhere and don't have a bottle opener. <laughs> but also um, the the crimp on a can is a double crimp. Whereas even on a on any beer cap, it's going to be just a single crimp. So uh, you have just less potential for air leakage as well. 
Yeah, for for a small brewery who is starting, um, I'm just trying to think of the equipment that you need. You know, like if I'm a nano brewery, I can start filling bottles right now, and you know, I'm a home brewer, so then I can just put the cap on and I'm good to go. Um, where where it seems like canny would require a lot more complex equipment. Um, what what have you seen for that? Well, uh, I think it's Cask. I think is the company name, and I'll I'll look that up for you for your show notes. But they have. Uh, a canning line, which is extremely competitively priced. As a matter of fact, it, it's, it was about $150,000 less than our bottling line. Really? Um, yeah. And so, and they make, um, uh, and that was on a, I think that was a six fill head canning line, but they make a double, like a two fill head canning line. And so if you're going into a 16, 16 ounce can, uh, that's a reasonable, uh, for a small nano brew, I would, I would guess, and that machine is much. I think it's under a hundred thousand, which, um, you know, maybe some of your people just fell off their chairs. But you know, it's not it's not uncommon to spend half a million on a bottling line. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's really quite cheap uh, in, <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, it, it, we just had a podcast with Aaron Brodiak, and he essentially said, "Plan on at least a million dollars for starting up a brewery." So yeah. you know, canning <laughs> or bottling—that's one aspect of it. So. Yep, yeah. you start talking about big numbers wherever you go if you're starting a brewery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so the further advantage of cans uh, that I see is uh, you don't require labels uh, because the the can itself is the label. Um, the you know they weigh less for shipping, which is is a big deal. I mean that's a real cost. Uh, shipping shipping costs money, and it's based on weight. Uh, it takes less warehouse space, so you can put um, ninety eight. 98 cans on a pallet, you can only put 72 bottles, uh, 72 cases of bottles, sorry. So you can put 98 cases of cans, 72 cases of bottles. Um, and it's, it's actually, I think, a little more stackable. And the, uh, the other part that I really like about it is that the, the packaging is so much less. So for every 12 ounce bottle, we have a, a piece, of, we have a bottle, we have a label, and we do, uh, in some of our cases, we have a neck tag, so that's two labels. You have a crown. Then you have to put that into a six pack and then you have to put that six pack into a mother box. So you have gotten in packaging, you're, you're really filling, you, like you need warehouse space to, to have that as well. <laughs> so with cans, uh, like we have, we have raw glass sitting in one warehouse. We have our packaging sitting in one warehouse. With cans, you just have the cans and then the flat pack, um, sort of that flimsy, case if you know what i'm talking about but where you yep. put 24 cans in uh that's much easier you know it takes up less room um you know i think i think we're canning around 20 years ago or 15 years ago when we started packaging i think that would have been the way to go so yeah uh, yeah and how does labeling work for canning um, <laughs> well so canning, like you buy the can. So that's so one of the disadvantages of cans is if we want to start a new beer, we just have to go through the expense of making a label. Yep. With cans, you have to buy them pre-printed, and so that's that's a problem. You know, <laughs> if you if you make a IPA and it's terrible, you've got a hundred thousand cans sitting, <laughs> you know, somewhere. And you, it, or if you discontinue it, the other problem with that is if you don't order on time. You know, you you have to wait until that packaging is ready. Whereas with glass, you could fill it uh, and then label it post production. That is not easy to do. I would never recommend that, but you can do it. <laughs> um, but the but I have seen right here in Maine, we have a brewery called Marshall Wharf, which does use a two can a two head. I, I'm not sure honestly. I think it's a two head fill can, and they have a 16 ounce can that they go into, and they've just left, left a blank space where they put a label like a like a clear sticker and it's a really nice looking package it really works well i don't know how they're putting that sticker on i would almost assume by hand because cans are pretty soft so a machine would probably smush it yeah um but i don't know but i've seen that and it's a very well implemented plan it looks the packaging looks really sharp okay hey um, what, what's your perception on uh people judging quality by all right you got the bottles versus the cans traditionally can or bottles have always been better than cans but i mean that's definitely been changing what, what's your perspective i think that's a generational perspective uh myself personally i prefer cans uh for, for all the reasons mentioned you know the beer quality stays better um but i I definitely think there is a perception of somebody like I'm in my thirties and I think somebody in their forties, fifties, they're thinking bottle is just a little more sophisticated. Um, you know, I, I think there, there is a, 
uh, an image, I guess, with a bottle that 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 could be a higher quality than a can. Uh, I myself don't feel that way, but I I think that is an image for people uh, of some generations. Okay. Hey, hey, Tyson, I I know that you're starting a little project uh, outside of Atlantic Brewing to help out uh, craft brewers out there. Um, You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, So actually, before I found your podcast, I had started a site called uh, craftbeerbusiness.com, and uh, it's talking about what we were talking about today, um, just... Whereas you're you're getting the people started like off the ground and running or up and running. My, I was more looking to discuss things like we were discussing today, like shipping kegs. You know, once once you've established your brewery, then how do you make these decisions like picking a distributor or should you go canning or bottling? And so I guess it's still in line with what you're doing, but it's a li- like it's more of a discussion point um, per topic rather than than a yeah. So it's uh, like I was just more or less discussing what we discussed in the office and just putting it on a, on an internet site on a blog. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And, and yeah. I've honestly, so, so you've talked to me. I've got a couple other emails on people that are they, they're saying that they're wanting to start up something kind of similar, but don't want to step on my toes. And I'm, <laughs> honestly, like any information that we can get out to this amazing uh, craft beer community, like I'm all for it. You know, yeah. it. it, it yeah, they, there's no competition here. It's just all if, if we can each contribute something to keep this movement going on. I mean that that's just great. So I fully yeah. encourage you. If anybody cool. has any other ideas or anything, definitely let me know. I mean it, it's been awesome to, and it's gotten me in contact with awesome people like you. Yeah, and I think it's it's a very similar to the collaborative effort of microbreweries. Like it is like if we have a problem with our bottling line. You know, we have forums and things, but it is not difficult. Like, I can pick up the phone and pretty much talk to any brewer. Um, You know, like, you just call them, and it's not, you know, they're not like, geez, you know, he's a competitor. They they just, they're willing to help you out. It's It's an amazing industry for that. The collaboration is, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is great. Everybody I've talked to, it's just been awesome. And I mean, the, the different personalities and stories that you get to experience, it's, it's honestly just so fun to talk to people. I, yeah. I, don't, I look forward to doing these podcasts every week. It's great. Yeah, I bet you do. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, I love listening to them and I think they're just so interesting. So glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you being here. So, Hey, I, I really appreciate the awesome information. Um, if people want to get in contact with you, where should they go? Um, so if they go to craftbeerbusiness.com, uh, they, that will be my website and, uh, then they can shoot me an email. It's Tyson at craft beer business. Uh, and if they'd love to sign up for my newsletter, uh, that would be wonderful. There's on the right hand side of my site, there's a email box and they can sign up and then I'll be in touch. All right. Cool, man. Well, and we'll, we'll have uh, links to all this on the show notes again. So Tyson, again, really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been great talking to you. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye bye. So I just want to thank Tyson again for coming on the podcast. Uh, He provided a lot of great information. And if you want to check out his website, again, that's craftbeerbusiness.com. We also have links to all the different things we talked about, like MicroStar, uh, the Cask Canyon equipment, the different uh, other podcasts that we mentioned. They're all in the show notes. Uh, So you can just go to microbrewer.com slash session nine. Uh, so that's M I C R O B R E W R dot com slash session nine, and you can find all this stuff there. And finally, uh, if you have any friends that you think would get some value out of the podcast, make sure to spread the word. We always love growing the microbrewer community. And if you also get a chance, make sure to leave a review in iTunes, and I'd really thank you for that. Uh, so until next time, support your local breweries, and we will see you on the next microbrewer podcast. Thanks for listening to the Microbrewer Podcast with Joe Shellaroo. We'll see you right here next time at microbrewer.com.